I have been discussing uh, extraction of aluminum for last three lectures. Before I begin today, let me recapitulate one or two important things. I mentioned that the hall herolds process for extraction of aluminum through electrolysis of alumina dissolved in cryolite came simultaneously in United States and France in the year 1886. It was a very interesting coincidence. Now, the process needed supply of pure alumina and it so happened that just about that time Bayer developed a process called Bayer's process which gave a method of producing pure alumina from bauxite ores. Now, none of these processes would have made a headway if electricity was not available. It so happened that just about 10 years earlier than that, commercial electricity became available. So, electricity was available, there was a process for alumina. And then there was this Hall Eros process for electrolysis of alumina in cryolite. Now, I have gone through the basics of Bayer's process and Hall Eros process. And I have to impress upon you the fact that everywhere one has to work within very narrow bands, especially in electrolysis. The in electrolysis, aluminum has to sink to the bottom, so it has to be heavier than the electrolyte. And the electrolyte, therefore, cannot have too much of alumina dissolved in it, because then the densities become too close. If the alumina concentration increases, density will increase. At the same time, we really want more alumina, because more alumina will bring down the energy requirement. Again, if there is too much of alumina, it will not dissolve because there is a solubility limit for alumina. So, it will form a crust. So, one has to work in a very narrow band of alumina concentration, say around 5 to 8 percent or so. Now, there is a very interesting uh, phenomenon associated with very low values of alumina in cryolite. And this you must remember, because in the aluminum industry, it is a highly discussed topic. It is called anode effect. Anode effect occurs when alumina concentration falls below 2 percent. If alumina concentration by any chance falls below 2 percent, then the operation of the electrolytic cell practically ceases. Why does this happen? Firstly, what is the phenomenon? And then secondly, why that phenomenon? I will tell you what is the phenomenon. The phenomenon observed in the industry is that if the alumina concentration comes below 2 percent, then the surface of the anode gets covered with bubbles. Bubbles that cover the surface and then prevent further electrolysis. So, when there are bubbles on the anode surface causing anode effect, then effectively the resistance in the bath increases enormously and therefore current falls. If the voltage is kept constant and the resistance has increased, then the current will fall. If the current falls, then there is no electrolysis, there is no production of aluminum. Now, in the industry, they operate with constant current source means there are devices 
which ensure a constant current path is taken. So, if the resistance has gone up and there is something to ensure constant current passing, then what happens is the voltage increases, because you have to get that much of current going through the cell, the resistance has gone up. So, the voltage goes up and the voltage can go up to something like 30 volts. So, the voltage has gone up to 30 volts, a lot of current is flowing, but there is no electrolysis. Then what happens to the current? The current does not cause electrolysis then, it jumps as sparks, electrical sparks straight from one electrode to the other electrode. So, it is not going to the electrolyte causing electrolysis, there are electrical sparks that that is completing the circuit and the sparks all that they can do is cause heating, there is no electrolysis. And there are multitude of small electric sparks and small lightnings in the cell. So, the current is going, but then nothing is happening. Now, why does it happen? This is found that it happens. There are many theories about why it happens and uh, I would rather not go into it, excepting that I would say that apparently it comes out of bonding of fluorine produced with carbon that if alumina level falls, you deposit fluorine. Fluorine bonds with carbon, produces all kinds of gases through the decomposition of this carbon fluorine compounds and they are on the electro surface and they will not go. What does one do then? Very often one has to stop electrolysis and try to get rid of this, these bubbles sticking to the surface. And one way to do that is to splash liquid aluminum on the anode surface to get rid of the bubbles. Or one can bring in fresh anode, fresh surface or in the same anode it can be lowered down bring in fresh surface on which electrolysis can take place. So, this is what is anode effect. Now, let me go back to the subject again as I was discussing. I mentioned last time that although basically you have alumina in cryolite and in theory alumina should give aluminum and oxygen ions and cryolite should only give you NaF ions and AlF6 ions, but in reality the whole lot of ions anions exist. They come out of reaction with the oxygen that has been introduced from alumina or the alumina itself and many research papers, research investigation finally established that there is coexistence of many anionic uh, species and it they depend on the mole ratio of NaF by AlF6. Actually, fluorine comes out of many of these and uh, I will I'll give the reactions little later. So, all these things, the presence of fluorine and depletion of alumina, they all add up to give an anode effect which virtually stops electrolysis and they have to be it has to be eliminated at any cost. Now, I had digressed a bit while showing you this slide last time and I will digress again today. Look at this slide, the way the world production of primary aluminum has gone up from 1854 to 2000 it is now you know more than a million some 13 uh, I think I have given you a figure earlier. India produces only around 0.35 million tons, we need to produce lot more, but the industry is on the rise. And while we are producing more and more aluminum, there are efforts to address the question of energy consumption 
energy consumption is being continuously decreased to a value which is a practical minimum. You can never go to the theoretical minimum because I mentioned that above the theoretical minimum which is required for decomposition of aluminum, you need little extra to heat up. So, you the practical minimum would be somewhere here and we are almost approaching that. The industry is also trying to bring down carbon consumption because it is a consumable uh, anode and there is nothing you can do, it will be consumed, but there are ways and means of trying to bring it down and there is also a very good trend in uh, reduction in carbon consumption. Now, before I go back to discussing the cell, let me mention uh, why I digressed last time. Last time I emphasized this point that India has very good reserves of bauxite ore and there are industrialists would like to set up plants for bauxite mining, some to go for export and some to be taken in for aluminum production. The government also wants it because the government then can create jobs, it will create a thriving aluminum industry which can compete in the global market and there is scope for tremendous expansion of the aluminum industry in the country because bauxite ores are available, know-how is available, R&D personnel are available, engineers are available. Problem is we do not have power and the power has to be produced from thermal power plants and then the whole world is now against CO, CO2 generation which are which cause global warming, but we have no other source of power now. We have reached the limit of Heidel power. There is no other source of power and we have to have thermal power plants, but we have to operate them more efficiently and we have to find out ways of handling the CO2 that is let off from the power plants. So, we have to go for a higher technology, but we need power. Look at the western countries, the developed countries, 100 years ago there was no restriction of what they did with their steam engines, with their power plants. They have produced all the CO2 in the world. They, they have had the field uh, to themselves and they have progressed. Now they are bringing in these things, but you cannot blame them, this is now a world problem. So, we cannot follow the technologies of the past, we have to develop our own technologies, but we need power at any cost. But there are other problems, apart from um, technological problems, technological problems are now interfaced with social and environmental problems. And although this course is about the technology of non ferrous metal production, I think it is fair that I give a hint of the in those interfaces. Let us talk about environmental regulations. You know the government has become now very, very touchy about environmental issues and rightly so. There are now laws which were not there 20, 30 years ago and industry could do whatever it wanted. It could take land, cut forests, set up plants, let off CO2 bring in toxic streams, put them in river or ponds, but now there are very strong restrictions. If an industry has to set up something in an area which was forested, now the regulation demands that if you are cutting down 1000 trees, you have to find a way of putting twice the amount of trees elsewhere a nearby area. Even more serious is at one time mining was done recklessly because you know no ore uh, lies on the surface, some exceptions. They are mostly below the surface and there is 
a layer of soil on top which we'll call the top soil. I mean most most uh, ores and minerals are found like that. So for mining one has to remove the top layer which may be a meter or two whatever and then dig for uh, the ores that you want. There was a time that people just didn't care. They just threw the top soil anywhere, anywhere they wanted, did whatever they wanted and when uh, they found there was no, nothing more to be done, they just abandoned the mines and they went away. Like you see this uh, brick kilns, bhattis you find, you know where the soil is taken out for making bricks and after that when they found they have dug enough, they go to another place again. A thing that has been realized now, that suppose you have done that and abandoned a mine, it takes some 200 to 300 years to have a topsoil like that again through a natural process. Nature cannot restore the topsoil so quickly, it takes decades, centuries. So, there is a very simple solution that we do not destroy the top layer which sustains life, which sustains flora and fauna. So, these days what the industries are required to do is before mining, they have to remove the top soil, keep it at one place, dig, do their mining whatever it is, when that is over, bring the top soil and put it back again, so that vegetation can grow again the flora comes back, the fauna comes back. This is being done in many of our industries and it is beautiful. If you, there are, I, I do not want to name, there are many uh, mines where you would not believe that mining has, has been done here because it looks so beautiful. Now, this again is a technological problem that you have a technological solution, but what about social issues? Now, this course is not about social issues, I cannot spend more time, but I cannot neglect at either. You know everywhere industry is demanding land, the government land belongs to the government in theory, but when they go to acquire the land, people who are there, they say what about our interests? We have been living here for centuries what happens to us when you get dislocated? To that there are simple answers, we are giving you a fair price for the land you own or maybe more than a fair price. Some industries go one step beyond and say, okay, we will provide job to the families, one member per family. Some say oh, we are going to provide you land elsewhere or housing elsewhere. These questions have always been there but they were not so strongly put forward in the past. Do not forget the Tatars also came to a tribal area which was forested, there they have set up an industry. Those people must have been dislocated, some were absorbed, some were looked after. You cannot say that in 110 years ago or 100 years ago what Tatars did was wrong. They have set up a beautiful township there is an industry which is doing wonders for the economy, provide jobs, some to the locals, many more to the people from all over the country. Look at Raul Kela steel plant, look at Durgapur steel plant, look at whenever there is a large industry, land was required, land had to be taken, people had to be re relocated. Their interests were sometimes taken care of, sometimes not taken care of. But now, this question has become of paramount interest because the so called weaker sections are no longer so weak, they know how to voice their opinion. They want to know how do we ensure that their interests are protected, not just for next four years, five years. If you give them a lump sum amount of money, many of them simply blow it away because they do not know what to do with a lot of money. They know how to do agriculture, they know how to get products from the forest. Now, to answer that question, I found from a story that a student of mine told me and I must share it with you before I go on with the lecture. I had a classmate, we were together in this institute 40 years ago, he was a civil engineer, 
Then he went to Germany, he's now settled in America. He sometimes comes and meets me. Some of his friends and he have set up a company for iron ore mining in northern areas of Canada where Eskimos live. Now, who owns those lands? On paper, it's a Canadian government. But the Canadian government means what? It was the white settlers who came 200 years ago and settled there. Now they say it's their territory. But now the Canadian government recognizes that those territories where there's so much of iron ore belong as much, if not more, to the Eskimos who have lived there for thousands of years. So now there has been a tripartite agreement between those Eskimo communities, the company that belongs to my friend and his associates and the government. All are stakeholders, all are interested in development there. They want to get something out of the iron ore, which, which, is, which is there in abundance and also other minerals. But now the local community of Eskimos, they have been taken into confidence and made a partner in the entire enterprise. So when the company grows, makes profit, the profit is shared by the government, by the company, by the Eskimos also. Now, the Eskimos and the others who live there, if they can find jobs, well and good. Even if they don't get jobs, they have a share of the profit. Now, whenever an industry is going to go to a place like that, the question comes about is about stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? not only the local community and the government and the people in the industry who are going to bring in the know-how and the capital and, and um, all their technological experiences. It can go even beyond that. Actually, the entire country has a stake in that. So there are NGOs who say, I may not belong to that place, but I'm involved with this kind of work. I am also a stakeholder. So nowadays, the approach is bring all the stakeholders at one place, have discussions, come to a consensus, so that we have a win-win situation. That we do set up an industry, it is necessary because you can't go on uh, depending on agriculture or on forest products. Anywhere where countries have progress, you will find number of people working in agriculture, they have drastically come down. It's true of China also, very much true for Western countries. because. Agricultural methods have also improved. They have become much more efficient. Uh, you have machinery. You have high, high yielding seeds. So why do the people go? They have the time now to go into industries. So we need to answer these questions and we need to answer them fast because otherwise our industries cannot grow and the aluminum industry is already facing this problem. And that's why I digress. In the East Coast, in Orissa, Andhra, there are bauxite mines uh, where mining activities cannot begin because the locals are protesting. The NGOs are protesting. They want a solution to the question as to who will protect their rights in the long term. If that can be done, aluminum has a great future. As regards the problem with technology like thermal power plants, the entire world is working on trying to make the technology more efficient and I'm sure there will be solutions found. Now, I have digressed quite a bit. Now, let me go back to the subject proper. Here is the aluminum electrolytic cell. I have shown you the picture once before. Let me show it again. This is a basic sketch. We have a layer of aluminum covered by the electrolyte which has alumina dissolved in it and you know there are heat losses from the steel walls and that is why some of this uh, aluminum and the electrolyte get frozen and that sort of gives kind of insulation on top with the alumina charge. It is all not all solid because the CO, CO2 that are here they have to come out of this also. Here is a better picture. It shows that 
you know no de no two designs are the same mm, do not think why it looked different and this one is looking different. You see there is a cover because the CO, CO2 that comes they have to go out in a stream and there are all kinds of feeding mechanisms, the current supply feeder, there is a crust breaker if there is a very strong crust which is not allowing gases to escape this thing will come and break it so that gases can escape and there are many other things that uh, details you can see here. What is more important is you see this the layout of the pots. Typically Hall-Heroult's aluminum smelting cell has many many pots arranged in series parallel connection may be in parallel there are bus bars going from two sides giving you voltage to all the uh, ports here. Now this this part ionic structure will look like electro reactions will go it will go to the next slide so ignore that read only up to here. So we are showing you the cross section and the plan view let us move forward. Again I go back to cryolite there is no other substitute for cryolite for dissolution of uh, alumina. Alumina will not dissolve in anything else, no other halide. It can dissolve in some oxides, after all, all slags have alumina, but you cannot electrolyze slags to produce alumina. Slags are very viscous, from there it cannot get aluminum, and maybe other things will come out of the slag. So, this is the only electrolyte we have Na3 Alx6. Unfortunately, it is not something that stays unchanged. It also decomposes, firstly it decomposes to give sodium and aluminum F6 3 minus ions. Then the hexafluoroaluminate that is it dissociates further and now it is generating fluorine this F minus can go to the anode and decompose to produce fluorine gas. It produces this sign. When you have produced this sign, it can also dissociate and produce aluminum at the cathode. Actually at 1000 degrees, Al F6 3 minus is about 25 percent dissociated and the degree of dissociation increases with decreasing cryolite ratio. Cryolite ratio means NaF and AlF F6. The more you have the AlF3 part, the cryolite ratio would be lower, and therefore the degree of dissociation will be more. Now, initially I have shown you a distribution of various anions that has oxygen. These two are the dominant ones because you will recall this distribution around here. After all, the ratio of NaF by AlF3 in cryolite is 3 is to 1, it is here, but we always add little extra NaF. So, you find at this point these two are the major about 0 0.2 and 0 0.2 of this and 0 0.2 of this. So, these two are the major anions which contain oxygen. When L2O3 is added, that is only it forms, it will not form otherwise, it comes out of the oxygen. Now, there is there are many theories as to how they form. Here are two equations L2 to react with L F 6 3 minus to produce this ion. Similarly, it also can react with L F 6 in a slightly different manner to follow the other one. Here there is no fluorine being formed, here fluorine is formed. So then many many things happen in uh, when L 2 or 3 goes into cryolite and so cryolite is much more than a supporting electrolyte. First of all from L 2 or 3 comes aluminum ions and oxygen ions. This is the only foreign ion because aluminum ion was already there in uh, cryolite it had sodium, aluminum, AlF6, 3 minus, F minus. This in a molecular way we can write them that this breaks into this, this breaks into that. I have given the ionic thing. Then there are many, many theories 
as to what all things happen. I do not wish to go through all this except in saying all the theories say that eventually some fluorine will evolve. So, fluorine evolves at the anode. Now, we are interested in increasing the current efficiency and also energy efficiency. The cell efficiency can be improved strictly controlling the addition of alumina and also many additives that I mentioned earlier. The current efficiency is minimum when L 2 3 content in the bath is 4 percent. To increase current efficiency, you have to increase it at least around 5 or 8 at various layers and higher than 4 percent current efficiency increases. However, to maintain a high current efficiency, the cell should be operated consistently with a high L 2 3 treatment. The way the cell has to operate will be under great control that we do not want fluctuations. And actually in many processes, if you can maintain things consistently, you get the highest efficiency. Like when you are driving a car, if you drive at a constant speed of about 45 kilometers, so you get the fuel efficiency maximum. But if you know, stop and accelerate and stop, fuel efficiency goes down. So, so is also true for uh, aluminum electrolysis cell. Try to keep things as uniform as possible. And I have referred to this equation once. I will end with this that many experiments have shown that current efficiency depends on alumina content, depends on ALF3 content, depends on calcium fluoride, in goes down with increase in temperature and depends on of course, the inter electrode separation. And earlier you saw the inter electrode separation is very carefully maintained you see this here 3 to 6 centimeter is the inter electrode separation. Both cathode and anode use graphite. The metal is heavier than the electrolyte sinks to the bottom. The anode product CO 2 to come out of the top. Anode can be pre baked blocks or single continuous Soderberg type electrode. Spacing is 3 to 6 and it has to be maintained as consistent as possible and of course, the current range can vary a great deal. Well, that is all I would say about aluminum electrolysis for now. I want to mention at the end something about electrolytic refining of alumina. Now, you will recall that in the case of copper, what we did, we took an impure copper anode, which was thick and a thin copper cathode and we did electrolysis like we do electrolysis for deposition of copper. If you have an aqueous solution, a copper salt, which is copper ion and you have a thick copper anode and thin copper cathode, start electrolysis, copper will get transferred from anode to cathode. So, this will thin down, this will become thick, you will produce pure copper, some impurities will dissolve into solution and some will become insoluble sludge. I will come to that later on. This is the principle of electro refining. Something like that is done in the case of aluminum also, but here there is a trick and the trick is this. In electrolysis, aluminum goes to the bottom because it is heavier than the electrolyte. In electrolefining, there is a scheme where aluminum floats to the top, pure aluminum and impure aluminum stays at the bottom. How will it stay at the bottom? Aluminum is alloyed with something made into very heavy, so that the heavy alloy will stay at the bottom, impure aluminum in between there is an electrolyte and through electrolefining very fine purified aluminum will come to the top. Here is the scheme. 
the purity of metal produced by Hall Heroes process is 99.5 percent. Now, this purity is sufficient for most alloying purposes, but for electrical applications and for canning, which requires a lot more uh, improvement of mechanical properties, formability, one needs a higher purity. Now, to achieve this higher degree of purity, there is an electrical electrolytic method called a three layer process. In this three layer, these are the layers. We make an alloy of impure aluminum and copper. This is 28 to 30 percent copper that makes the density of the alloy about 4.5. Copper is very heavy. So, this alloy of aluminum, which is which is actually the the impure aluminum we are calling it stays at the bottom. We find an electrolyte which is lighter than this and it is adjusted to 2.8. On top of that aluminum pure aluminum which is 2.3 density will float. Scheme is similar there is a graphite electrode here, there is an anode this is now cathode, it is no longer anode, it is cathode because aluminum will go there and this is the anode, this is also graphite at the bottom. Commercial aluminum or scrap can be continuously fed into this alloy from here. We have to find a way of adding copper also because so that we maintain this density and there is magnesite insulation and so after during electro refining copper and uh, aluminum will go from the impure layer to the pure uh, aluminum layer. A dense electrolyte is what we need in the middle. The approximate composition of the dense electrolyte is now different from simple uh, cryolite. It is made up of aluminum fluoride 36 percent cryolite only 30 percent and barium fluoride, barium is heavy 18 percent, calcium fluoride 16 percent and the density of the electrolyte enables aluminum purifier during electrolysis to float upwards to form a top layer. So, we have these three layers now, the impure metal is alloyed with copper and this heavy alloy forms a bottom layer. The entire thing will happen at about 950 degree and from impure aluminum which we alloyed with copper, we can produce here very pure aluminum of purity of about 99.99 percent. And this kind of cell, it operates on a smaller scale, it produces about 100 kg per cell per day. Principle is very similar, we have changed the electrolyte made it heavier so that aluminum can float in during aluminum electrolysis aluminum was sinking, but here aluminum has to float the impure aluminum in the form of an alloy is kept at the bottom. Okay. Now, let us now end this lecture by discussing what are the future methods in aluminum production. By now, I am sure you know that the Hall Heroes process invented and introduced in 1886 has gone on and on and on for more than 100 years, 125 years now. And people have been constantly searching for an alternate way of making aluminum. One or two are being discussed, still they have not become industrially viable. The most important development that was announced about 15 years ago and people thought that is the solution, but it, it did not prove it to be so is the Alcoa process. Alcoa is aluminum company of America, a very big aluminum company. In this process, the idea is to abandon alumina in cryolite electrolysis. They wanted some other solute in some other solvent. 
and the aim was to produce aluminum trichloride for subsequent electrolysis. So, the alumina produced by the Bayer's process is still required. That is the starting point. You get pure Al2O3 that has come from Bayer's process. Now, it will be chlorinated. Now, you know I have discussed during general principles there are two ways of chlorinating oxides. One is direct chlorination that you chlorinate by Cl2 or chlorine containing compound, but in most cases we go for indirect chlorination or reduction chlorination. You bring in a reducing agent also. This is what is required in this case as well. So, we say chlorinated under a reducing conditions which means in presence of carbon at 700 to 900 degrees to produce a mixture of Al2, AlCl3 and CO2. The reaction is this aluminum, alumina from Bayer's process in presence of carbon it react with Cl2 to produce aluminum trichloride vapor, carbon monoxide and CO2. Here is the flow sheet the chlorination done in a fluidized bed and in the fluid bed if there is we can bring in the temperature to 700 70 degrees aluminum trichloride solidifies that aluminum trichloride goes for electrolysis in a molten bath comprising sodium chloride potassium chloride and, alu and aluminum chloride is the solute. So, basically it is a sodium chloride lithium chloride bath. Here electrolysis can occur at a lower temperature of 700 degrees only. Aluminum will no longer be uh, liquid I guess, uh, but then the entire process would be at a lower temperature. Here I have given more details that by condensation we separate LCL3 particles, these particles are continuously fed into an electrolytic cell with fused chloride electrolyte. It has only 5 percent LCL3, 50 percent sodium chloride, 45 percent LiCl, temperature is 700 degrees. Upon electrolysis by direct current, liquid aluminum, sorry, it will be liquid, yes, just above the melting point, liquid aluminum is formed at cathode and gaseous chlorine liberated at the anode. The chlorine produced is recycled in order for chlorine to the fresh alumina. Now, during electrolysis chlorine will come out, it will go back for chlorination of alumina. It seems to be a very attractive process. How it is done, the electrolytic cell is also very attractive. I will come to that. But before that, yeah, this is what this is what the alcohol process, this is how we can write it. LCA3 by condensation, solid aluminum, etcetera. Now, the cell that alcoa tried was also very interesting. This cell had what we call bipolar electrodes. I mean, these are the graphite electrodes suspended horizontally in this electrolytic cell and they were bipolar means one side of this was negative other positive negative positive negative positive negative positive negative. So, this is the cathode which draws aluminum, but aluminum is drawn everywhere on the cathode side and after getting aluminum ion getting discharged, it falls down to the bottom. So, in the bottom alumina is uh, aluminum collects and on the plus side, I mean the anodes chlorine is liberated, it is liberated here, liberated here, liberated there, liberated there, liberated there. All the chlorine being liberated will come out from here. Now, this these electrodes are called bipolar electrodes. I mean the same and uh, same piece of uh, graphite is serving both as anode and cathode. Let me read what, you, what is here, it is a bipolar cell consisting of several bipolar electrodes. 
each bipolar electrode behaves like a cathode at the top surface and like an anode at the bottom surface. A continuous flow of electrolyte must be maintained across the cell in order to prevent the molten aluminum produced upon electrolysis from forming pools on the electrode. They should not hang on the electrode. The, it must be made to fall to the to the bottom. An arrangement is made to collect the molten aluminum at the bottom. Chlorine rises to the top from where it is collected and it goes for chlorination again. Now, it may be noted that one bipolar cell is equivalent to as shown here is equivalent to five conventional monopolar cells in series. These are monopolar cells in series. Also, the productivity and the cell voltage of the bipolar cell are five times more than those of the conventional monopolar cell. Alcoa has claimed operation at current densities up to 23,000 ampere per meter square with an electrode gap of less than 1.3 centimeter. You need less electrode gap now because you need less CT, but this bipolar arrangement enhances the surface area of the electrode enormously. Now, the advantages of alcohol process are listed here. The, elect the chloride electrode has much higher conductivity compared with that of conventional hot arrow cell. Distance between the electrodes is lower. These two factors appreciably lower the energy wasted in the form of heat that is produced due to current flowing between the electrodes. You need some heat, but you are wasting less heat. Further, the chloride electrolysis leads to a higher current efficiency and alcoa hopes to decrease the overall energy consumption by over 30 percent. If proved successful, this process could revolutionize the aluminum industry, which is extremely energy intensive. So, it would give rise to several advantages. Operation would be at a lower temperature. Energy requirement should be almost 30 percent lower. There is no consumable graphite electrode. These electrodes that you see placed horizontally, bipolar electrodes are not being consumed. So, you are not consuming, you are not producing any COCO2. You are producing at the anode chlorine, which is reused for chlorination of CO2. So, on the whole, you are simply producing aluminum from alumina without consumption of the electrolyte, without consumption of the electrodes with lower energy. Now, it sounded very exciting, but there is a negative side to it. The negative side is aluminum trichloride is an extremely toxic and reactive substance. Like I myself have had an accident with aluminum trichloride. When I opened a bottle without knowing it was aluminum trichloride, I opened the bottle. Immediately, the aluminum trichloride powders reacted with moisture to produce acid vapor HCl. The entire room became was covered with fumes and I did not know what was happening. I should have been careful, but I had not studied uh, earlier the properties of aluminum trichloride. You open the bottle and boom, there is an explosion. The whole room is full of fumes and actually then the fire fighting engine came in. Now, if this is the chemical that you want to handle in an industry, everything has to be done under sealed conditions, under covered conditions with extreme care. That makes the technology a very, very diff thing, difficult thing to adopt. I suspect it is because of this that extremely sophisticated arrangement required for handling aluminum trichloride that the technology has not come into the market. It has remained as an R and D project. It has been demonstrated in a pilot plant scale, but there is no industry which is operating based on aluminum trichloride electrolysis. Whereas, see the way you can handle alumina, there is no problem with alumina. It works with the cell. Anybody can operate and e everything is going on. There is no problem at all anywhere. But aluminum trichloride in theory is very good, but it does not quite work out. Okay. 
what are the other the other process that have had been proposed and on which people worked also is called the alkan process the alkan process is based on the simple thing that if you take alumina and reduce by carbon pyrometallurgical reduction by carbon you should produce aluminum but that doesn't happen because it forms carbide so what the alkan uh, process says is okay let's form the carbide and see what can be done so in the alkan process you reduce alumina by carbon at 2000 degrees centigrade in an electric arc furnace you produce an alloy which has 50 percent aluminum 30 percent iron because you know in there is always in the uh, in bauxite uh, there is um, iron. you are not starting with uh, uh, Bayer's process aluminum you are starting with the ore bauxite as such so you get iron you produce you have some silicon you have some titanium you have carbon because there is some carbide then react with preheated aluminum then we go back to uh, once I discussed how you purify aluminum by using an intermediate gas we go back to that method you should have preheated aluminum trichloride vapor is made to react with uh, impure aluminum this that alloy and it is a reversible process you produce monochloride take it out cool it you produce pure aluminum. So, we take that impure aluminum as that alloy with iron car carbide etcetera react with aluminum trichloride for monochloride separate than monochloride cool and you get uh, alkane process that is what this process is ok. Now, I will uh, end this by simple one, one just one comment I have been mentioning that no two industry operates in the same manner not only because cells are designed they are supplied by different uh, people also because the raw materials with which they operate are also not the same. See these are the compositions of Indian uh, um, bauxite this is the analysis of bauxite from different mines of Hindalco in one company itself owns these mines and you see the variation in alumina, silica, TiO2, Fe2O3, P2O5. So, now a company would like to try to have a blend where the composition does not change very much. Another company may be using another blend depending on the accessibility to the mine. So, the raw materials coming to different uh, aluminum companies are not the same and when they are not the same the process has to be different. I think I will end this now in my next lecture I will touch upon the Indian scene. I shall talk about what some uh, aluminum companies are doing in India, what they are saying are the requirements of the aluminum industry, what should be done, what should not be done, what are the plus points, what are the minus points. So, this completes my general discussion on aluminum. I would request you to please refer to the three books I have shown you. You must read them. You need not own all the two books, but if you can own the book called non ferrous metal production book it will be good and the other one also you should have is energy in metals and minerals industries. Thank you.